nation's favourite antiques experts. Let's get fancy. Behind the wheel of a classic car. I'm always in turbo. And a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Hot stuff. The aim, to make the biggest profit at auction. <gasps> but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners. Cha-ching. Oh, my goodness. And valiant losers. Mm, bonkers. Will it be the high road to glory? You are my ray of sunshine. Oh, stop it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. Comment ça va? Tout le monde? That sweet Gallic 2CV is back on the road in the southwest. But it has a funny European gear stick, don't you know? What's that? Second, I think. Oh no, you might have gone straight to four. That's first. Sacre bleu. To push forward. That's it, second. I'm happy in second. Yeah. I know that you that you are nervous. Yeah. You are a nervous passenger. Is that you rub your leg? Is that right? Do yes. I? Mm. Yeah, but it's when I go like this. That <laughs> <laughs> you really need to be worried. <laughs> Catherine Southern is at the wheel for a fourth outing with passenger and fellow antique head David Harper, and the trip is heating up. I need to get a bit of air in here. It's very warm. Slam that up, Catherine. You slam it up, slam it. That's it. Oh, that's good. Isn't and that's it? good as this, but it's called modern technology. <laughs> We're near the end. <laughs> <laughs> We're near the end of this trip. That's the air conditioning. <laughs> oh God, I am hopeless. Ah, oh, mon petit chou à la crème. <laughs> Last time they were model experts. Give me a smile, baby. Why? And you should go... David, you, you're an idiot. They picked up only the choicest things. It's cracked. David revealed some of his many talents. I can juggle. And we were kept on the edge of our seats. It's going to jump out. Oh, fox. Yikes, oh. Do you want to win this time, David? Oh, of course I do. You can't lie about it. Would it upset you if I win? No, I wouldn't be upset, but I really want to win. Of course I do. I want to win. Like I want to win decree. more. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to win well, right You today. need to, because you've got a lot of making up to do, because I thrashed you last time. It's true. Catherine's original £200 has now grown to £290 and 2p. But David garnered a rather impressive £385.42. The pair, of course, are rivals of old. <laughs> but how well do they really know each other? Do you have a middle name? I do, Louise. You can't really make a nickname out of Louise. My middle name is Kingsley. Kingsley? Yeah, don't pull a face when you say it. Kingsley. Kingsley. Yes. That's a strange one. Why is it strange? Well, I've never heard of it before. Oh, Kingsley. Well, there you go, then. It's different, isn't it? So my nickname at home was Kings. Kingsley. No, no. I've just told you what my nickname was. It was... Don't change my nickname. <laughs> it was Kings. 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 OK. Oh, I bet you love that, being all very <laughs> royal. Having set out in Kent, our experts are motoring along the south coast to the West Country before their final reckoning in Trowbridge. King David, King no, David. Kings. 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 Our antiques royalty will process to Tavistock today, calling first at Bournemouth, blessed with tourist attractions and sandy beaches, drawing five million visitors every year. There will quite possibly be ice cream later. Mine's a 99, by the way. Ooh. But first, they'll be swimming in antiques at the Den, with plenty of potential finds to help keep them afloat. This place is filled with the wares of a hundred dealers. And James is at the helm today. Oh, and that's Carlos. Go on, get lost. It would be so easy to amongst all these aisles. Well, she's upbeat this morning. Well, hello to you. It's described as an 18th century bottle vase. And that's exactly what it is. It may well be a little earlier than the 18th century, possibly Delft, so Dutch, it may well be English, but definitely tin glaze, which is very prone to chipping. And if you look at the shape, it is an absolute copy 
from the 17th, 18th century of the very expensive Chinese porcelain. So this thing was made during the height of the Chinese porcelain craze in Europe. And this is a really very good example. And look at the price, 65 pounds. I'm going to ask for a discount, obviously, but I don't even care how much discount I get. Very decisive. Any more for any more? Catherine? That's interesting. Letter racks. 1930s, 1940s, a lot of people writing letters. Something like this would have been quite popular. I think that this probably dates to the 1920s, 1930s. They've called this Chinese. Now, I don't think that's Chinese at all. I think that's actually Japanese. Japanese lacquered letter tray. Quite nice decoration on it. You've got a couple of figures there at the bottom. Are they playing games? No, they're not. They're eating, I think. I like the way that it's coloured as well at the top. Lacquerware is quite a popular technique that they were doing in Japan. And this sort of thing possibly exported late 19th century, early 20th century. The ticket says £28. One in the bag. Right, where next? Crikey, we're all very focused this morning. The clock is ticking, though. Ah, now there's something that is not, strictly speaking, an antique. So it's a stylized and relatively modern cat. So 1960s, 1970s. I adore handmade, craftsman-made pieces. The marks in the clay where it's been cut and it's been trimmed, finger marks where it's been shaped, all evidence of just something that has been beautifully handmade. But it's really characterful, priced. Yeah, 30 quid. He could easily double his money, so he is jumping in the car with me and he's off to auction. There's no stopping him today. Looks like Catherine um, has made her way to the bar. Has he just changed his shirt? <laughs> Get yourself a garland oh, going on. Lovely, lovely. What are we going to have? Cocktail? Yes. Can you do any cocktail? I can do anything, but you look like a... Plonker? Well, yes, yes. You look rather stupid. Steady. You look like a kind of pina colada type man. So I can do cocktail. <laughs> I think she's had a few already. Yeah, what do you think? Oh, I think Got you the moves? Are amazing. You are amazing. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you you're not. I can't remember what was in here. You better go and get your cash to pay for this. I'm not paying for this experience. Did I just hallucinate that? On a more sober note, time for David to secure that cat and the Delft vase. Funky cat, 1960s, 70s. Very nice thing. Priced at £30. I want him, no negotiating. That's fair. Good. Now then, what about the 18th century, or even possibly a little earlier? It's a lovely thing. Bottle of ours. What is the best price? I can do 50 on it. 50 is fine. I don't want any more discount than that, so I owe you 80. Yeah. 80 down and £305 left in his piggy. And off he goes. The cat and the vase will follow to auction. Now, back to the erstwhile barmaid. The Entor theme going on. Japanese cloisonne. That's something I have never bought on the road trip. And the really intricate pieces, 1850s, 1860s, can really achieve some incredible prices at auction. Now, I don't think this is 1850s or 1860s. I don't even know if it is... 19th century. I would say it's more likely early part of the 20th century. This pattern here around the side, around the opening of the vase, that's very typical. This has got £60 on it and I think it's probably one of a pair. Yep, I'm going down an oriental theme. I'm off to Japan. No, you're not. You're off to the next aisle. <laughs> I've had so much fun. Good. It's been brilliant. I found this little letter rack 
pretty thing. You've got 28 on that, but I haven't actually noticed while I'm talking to you. It's got a bit of a crack, so a bit of damage there. Right, OK. But that um, little cloisonne... A theme going here, isn't there? I've got a theme. Yeah. Can a deal be done? Yes, here we go. I can actually do 18 on the lacquered letter act. Oh, OK. Which 18? is quite a discount. Perfect, And Lovely. 40 on the bus. 58. And with that, she's left with £232. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Good luck very much, James. Thank you. Bye. Nice work. Now, what about that 99, eh? The wind's blowing David to the west now, a mile or two along the Dorset coast to the town of Poole. With its large natural harbour, this is a busy ferry and commercial port. The name of the town is also synonymous with pottery, a booming industry here until 1999, when the original pool workshop moved away. But at Studio Pool, close to the original site, company director John Lejeune is reviving its fortunes and keeping the craft alive. And you must be John. Hello, David, yes. If you'd like to come in, I'll show you what we do. I would love to. First, John is going to show David their collection of pool pottery dating back to the foundation of the company as Carter & Co in 1873. This is our collector's corner. So these are all original pieces of pool pottery as we once knew it, I suppose. This represents just a small proportion of what pool pottery is made over the year. The natural environment around pool provided the perfect raw materials for pottery making and the ball clay that was mined locally was shipped out by barge from Pool Quay. It's known that pottery was produced on the quay for literally thousands of years. Really? Yeah. The reason was that there's such an abundance of clay in the area. And good clay, good simple clay, clay. Good clay, yes. I mean, there's, there's local uh, clay pits. I mean, one of the famous ones would be Blue Pool which was mined right up until just be the beginning of the 20th century. Now, obviously, with the Industrial Revolution, the, the expansion of the British Empire, pool pottery must have been shipped all around the world. The pool pottery is world famous. I mean, they were shipping to Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, South Africa, all over the world. Incredible. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Carter and pool pottery boomed with tiles designed for pubs hospitals, tea rooms, domestic interiors and shop fronts. They also made tiles for the London Underground. So the next time I jump on the tube in London, yes. I'm very likely to be... I, I always admire the old stations. Yeah. I'm very likely to see some pool pottery on the wall. No, indeed. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. The years following the First World War brought in a new period of creativity and pool began working in new styles. And in the 20s, they became even more elaborate still. And they're the pieces that, when they come up in auction today, if they're the rare designs and rare patterns, can make, you know, four or five figure sums. Yeah. Pool continued to evolve as styles and tastes changed in the post-war decades. They introduced a new person, Albert Reed, who came in and, along with the guy Sidden and Master Potter, formed a set of free-form shapes and this was what the 50s rebound was based on. Right. These vases were very naturalistic looking and stylized patterns. Yeah. It was a prolonged period of great success. In the 70s, where they're sending 15 imperial tonnes a week all over the world. 15 tonnes? Tonnes, yes, 15 tonnes a week. That's a lot of a lot, It's a lot of teachers. It, it really is. Mm. Would you say the 70s were the peak? I'd say it was one of the peaks, mm. and that was really the last real hey hey day of pottery production in the UK. But Studio Pool is successfully continuing the legacy, producing work for the 21st century. We have our own staff here who were export pottery artists and potters. And so we have the skills necessary to continue to produce hand-thrown, hand-painted wares, individual one-off pieces rather than the mass production you might get in other areas. Just time now for master potter Alan White to supervise David in the throwing of a pot. Uh-oh. Both hands. Both hands like that. Now push it down. Ah! Oh, dear. I've got a carbuncle. I can't look. Alan. Steady. Something's happened. There's nothing. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I am worried. Now push your thumb down. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got to try and pull it up. <laughs> I was doing so well. That's I, like kind I, of modern I, art. I'd take you on this afternoon. Hmm. Pottery, alive and kicking, in pool. Excellent. Now I spy Catherine lurching along the road. <laughs> oh, I'm saying nothing. Sorry. <laughs> that was a crunch. Mind that clutch. 
she's headed southwest to Wareham, a bonny market town sitting between the rivers Froom and Piddle. The Piddle is neither puddle nor pool, but it does flow there. <laughs> Yesterday's collectibles is her final emporium today. Now, that's a cute shop front. <laughs> Perfect parking. Just like the driving, eh? The shop is bijou, and I mean daintily proportioned and packed full of potentially precious things. Is that vintage pool I see on those shelves? Millie is keeping shop today. Is that more pool? Gosh. That's rather nice. Little easel back travelling clock. Easel back because this literally folds nice and flat down like a photo frame or like a, a picture with this lovely pink guilloche enamel surround. This is 20s, 30s. Now, I always say don't buy damaged enamel and that has got a little bit of damage there. And once it is really broken like that, it can actually spread and it could easily flick up here and damage the rest of it. But that actually is not bad. I think really probably because it's a pale pink colour, I think had it been a vibrant green or blue, it would be more noticeable. But as it's the pink, it's not too bad. Got 159 on it. That's a possibility. 159? That's a lot of money. Anything else? Ooh. Shiny things galore look. Something slightly more contemporary. A bit of Scandi. Scandinavian silver and enamel brooch. OK, so I should see a nice... So there's a mark on here for 925, so that's a silver mark. And then there is a cross... <sighs> there's a cross mark on it. The mark is for Norwegian Axel Holmsen, who founded his workshop in 1932, creating silver jewellery in a Nordic modernist style. What does it say on the label? It just says £49. I might go and have a chat with Millie and see if we can do something on these two. Good idea. Millie. I have picked up two quite similar items in their materials. I've got a bit of silver and enamel. Lovely. I wonder if I could make you an offer on this. It has got 159 on the ticket. Yeah. But there is a bit of damage there. I wonder if I could offer 85 on that. Yeah, we'll go for that. And then how does 25 sound on that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. 110 yeah. pounds, is that OK? Thank you. Very generous discounts, thank you, Millie. And she still has £122 left. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope that brooch doesn't disappear into the seat. Ha, time to pick up David and call it a day. This car is becoming part of you. You're handling it beautifully. You just put it straight into fourth. Have I? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, as I was saying, you're really <laughs> developing a relationship, not a particularly good one, with this car. I don't like the gear stick. <laughs> <laughs> what? David, you can handle the gear stick tomorrow. <laughs> Nighty night. And uh, before you can say vive la France, they're back on the road. I love mornings. Don't you love mornings? Uh, not as much as you. I know you're not a morning person. I love that. I love being with people who are not morning people on a morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be all... Ah! Yeah, I can be jolly and really irritating. Yeah, yeah. you are irritating I'm at the moment. Really, oh, I'm irritating, <laughs> all right. Moving swiftly along, time for a show and tell. Take a look at him. What is that? It's called a cat. I heard something meowing down the bottom there. That's rubbish. <laughs> Meow! What should we call him? Lucky. <laughs> Un unlucky. Let's be unlucky, yes? Yesterday, David also hoped for good luck with the Delft bars. Well, hello to you. Which is gorgeous. But he still has £305.42 to spend. Catherine went for things small and decorative, an enamel clock. That's rather nice. A cloisonne vase, a Scandinavian brooch, and a letter rack. So she's left with £122 2p. On we go. Day two in Dorset. But can you sense the sea? Because I can. 
You can't smell it. I can smell it. Can you? And I can feel it in the air. I'm feeling it. I'm getting in touch with my <laughs> Celtic roots, because the Celts were big worshippers of nature. Yeah, they were, but I can't feel the sea, can't I feel can the air. I see feel it. it. Absolutely feel it. That's lethal, that window, isn't it? Well, being French, it's like, um... Guillotine! Guillotine. Ah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. Chops your, um... Chops your arm off. Mon Dieu! Well, they are near the sea, and Swanage is first stop for David, after dropping Catherine off. It's a lovely coastal town on the Isle of Purbeck which is really a peninsula. Just look at that gorgeous sandy beach. David's a man on a mission, though, and the charming Old Forge Antiques is a Grade Two listed building which looks just the place for an excellent rummage. Ship ahoy! Ooh. Blink. Heck. This is a proper antique. Obviously, it's screaming that it comes from the Orient. But more than that, this bronze jardinier feels nice and cold, and it comes from Japan. Made between 1868 and 1912, the Meiji period. And this is going to be heavy, I assure you. Whoa. It's just a cracking lump of proper antique. And I did spot the price. This is the best bit, priced at £60. And yes, it's a proper antique and it even sounds like one. Here we go, yet again, it's gonna ring like a bell. I don't know, right up his boulevard. Perfect. Any more for any more? Jeepers, creepers. That looks very rare to me. Let's have a look. This little miniature garden set is mind-bendingly fascinating to me. We've got a fabulous summer house at the back here. We've even got band members here. But I'm going to pick up an example of one of the groups of people, and just have a look at the quality of this thing. So we've got a mother and children with a little baby in a pram. Look at the fashion. This is absolutely early Victorian, probably 1840, 1850. So the quality is just fantastic. No maker's mark. This, I think, is continental. Very likely to be German. Priced at £70. There we have it. So a great collector's piece, and I think that stands a cracking chance of making a cracking profit in auction. Possibly risky. I've seen that sort of thing go either way. Stand by, Julia. Stop being so busy, Julia, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some deals. Should we try and do some deals? Yes, please. OK, two things. One, the big lump of bronze, that Japanese Jardinier. Oh, yes. Priced at 60. Could that be 50? For you, definitely, yes. Thank you very much. Nice, easy deal. OK, now what about a 19th century lead little garden set? Priced at 70, could that be 60? Yes, it can. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Two deals, very simple. It's 110. That was easy. I hope you do well with them. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Nice work. Bye-bye, Swanage. An hour away along the Jurassic coast is the town of Weymouth. Its harbour nestling in a sheltered bay, looking peaceful today as Catherine makes her way to town. But <laughs> she's on the warpath. Local history enthusiast John Dixon is ready and waiting. Good morning, Catherine. Welcome to Weymouth. To tell her about a battle which raged here four centuries ago, shaping the very future of the nation. Look at you, you look incredible, but I'm guessing that's not your normal outfit. No, uh, what you see me wearing today is a costume from the 1640s, the time of the English Civil War. I have a costume for you to wear as well if you'd like to join me. OK, right, go on then, when in Rome and all that. Well, hello, good wife Southern. In the early 17th century, all the kingdoms of the British Isles were riven with political and religious conflict. In 1642, there began what has come to be known as the English Civil War, or the English Revolution. 
King Charles I believed that he was appointed by God. Therefore, he didn't need to rule with the use of parliament. And there were power struggles over religion, outcries over his economic policies. And then war broke out. All of a sudden, the whole country was thrown into turmoil. Father occasionally fought son, and on many occasions, brother fought brother. Why Weymouth, though? The parliamentarians held most of the navy at that time, and most of the ports along the south coast. Charles needed somewhere safe to bring in supplies and troops to the country to aid his war efforts. It's not inconceivable to think that over the sea in France, a large force of troops were waiting to invade this country, and Weymouth was ideal. Royalist sympathisers in the town hatched a plan to aid the King's army to take control of the ports of Weymouth and Melcombe. This was the Crab Church conspiracy, and it might have succeeded had it not been discovered by Colonel William Sydenham, commander of the parliamentary garrison. 6,000 Royalist troops were lured into a trap and faced with a bloody assault by the smaller force. He managed to take a large force and funnel them into a narrow front so that as the muskets fired and the cannons roared, the cannonball would penetrate deeper into the ranks, causing far greater casualties than if they'd been spread wide apart. It was a brutal, brutal battle. And how long did it go on for? The battle only lasted three or four hours before Sydenham repelled the Royalist invaders. It's been estimated that the Royalists lost at least 500 men. The parliamentarians only lost a dozen. So much history right on our doorstep. Much of Weymouth and Malcolm was destroyed during that battle, and Weymouth still bears the marks of the battle today. Come with me then, Catherine. This where we are now is the old High Street. The pub where we've just been in and the old town hall are buildings that were around at that time. And this is the site of where the battle would have actually taken place. OK, let's turn things around. What about if the Royalists had won? So crucial was Weymouth that a letter was discovered a few years ago from a Royalist officer that stated the very crown of England depended upon Weymouth. Had the Royalists have won that night, things could have been very different for England. Charles could have imported 25,000 French troops through the Twin Ports. Had that occurred and he had the supply chain, he could have expanded through the south of England and rekindled his campaign against the parliamentarians. England could have been a very different country to the one we live in today. The Crab Church conspiracy has been dubbed Dorset's bloodiest secret, but folk like John are helping to spread the word about this dramatic chapter in the Civil War. David is thankfully still in 21st century civvies <laughs> and behind the wheel of the 2CV. Wending his way north to Dorchester, Dorset's county town and Thomas Hardy's fictional caster bridge. We may be in Wessex, but our antique centre this morning sounds distinctly Irish. Dadana refers to mythical gods with supernatural powers. David's a mere mortal, so he's on his own. There's all sorts here and he still has £245 in his pocket. Right, let me show you something that I cannot afford to buy. So this is worth £1,000, £2,000, £3,000. Who knows? It's love it or hate it. There's not very much in between. Personally, I love it. That is a beauty. But not your beauty at that price. <laughs> Hold the bus, let's catch up with Catherine, who's headed just along the road to Dorchester Curiosity Centre. This is the old bus depot, and there's many a double-decker's worth of stuff to spend her £112 on. And there's Michelle, the conductor. Ding, ding! Come on, Catherine, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round... Oh, I'm a bit carried away with this bus theme. Dark. Nice. That is something very special. I like this. I like this a lot. Now, this is big. I wanted something big. I've got a cartwheel. I would date this probably from, I don't know, what is it, 1870s? And I think it's really a decorative piece. I can see it in a garden with some nice flowers growing around it. It's got 95 on it. 
I don't know if that's good or not. Food for thought, I think. Indeed. Back at Dedanon, are the Irish gods smiling on your man? Wowza. Oh, hello to you. I mean, if you want a door knocker, you might as well get a door knocker. Seriously, take a look at the design. It screams India. It's cast brass, very heavy, good quality, and handmade, priced 50 quid. I think he's a potential good auction buy. Simon's the dealer in the snazzy hat. Simon. Ah, David. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. Now then, do you know that brass, funky Indian door knocker of yours? Oh, late, early 20th century. Do that, you think it is? I think so. It's not expensive at 50 quid, but can you do it a little bit better? Given it's... Uniqueness. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I can let you take it for 45. If that take a five off. That'll do. That will do me. Yeah. OK, I'll leave you 45 quid. Lovely. I'll go and grab the knocker. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Yes. Nice doing business. With £200 and some loose change left, he's off. Right, now, has Catherine done any cartwheels or bought any old iron? Well, this is interesting. Victorian, I guess, a drying rail for your clothes. And it's, I'm guessing, about 18... towards the end of the 19th century, maybe 1870s, 1880s. If you think back to Victorian times, you would have had huge pieces of clothing on this dryer. Auntie's bloomers or great granny's bloomers would have actually taken up probably the entire rail. I could put my long johns on it. But I think now, if you use something like this as a slightly oversized towel rail, I think it would be quite impressive. I'm interested in this, but I think possibly these finials aren't right. And the reason I'm saying this is that you've got some sort of sticky tape that's just had a little fiddle here. Careful. Uh, yep, there we go. These come off and you've got tape underneath here, which suggests that these aren't the original finials because they don't fit tightly. I think they did have ceramic little tops to them, but it was not these. Looks good, but certainly not at that price, £160. I think that's way too high. Well, yesterday I went through my oriental phase and my enamel phase, and now I seem to be going through my big iron phase. I like this idea of themes. Can't beat a bit of heavy metal. Michelle, Michelle? Yeah, <laughs> Michelle, <laughs> Michelle <laughs> I've had a great time. I have found a couple of things I like. Great. I wanted big. OK. I found a cartwheel that's got £95 on it. And then I've also found something completely different. I found a Victorian clothes line. That's priced up at about 160 okay. I'd like to offer you £50. £50 each? Each, not for the two. Thank you. <laughs> Um, for the cartwheel, I think that's a little little low. We could possibly, at a push, go to 70. OK. I think the clothes rail is probably the better one for me. I think I'm more likely to make some money on that. I think the cart might be a little risky. OK. The clothes rail, again, a little low at 50. We could probably stretch to... 60 on that. I'm happy with that. Are you happy, Are you happy with yeah, that? Yeah, I'm happy with 60. OK. 20, 40, 60. There we go. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you, Michelle. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Heave ho and away we go. And that was the last stop. What's the verdict on their days in Dorset? It is wonderful. I mean, I could keep on going on this journey, genuinely. I could do this for years. How's that sound to you? Oh, gosh, no, please. I've had enough. <laughs> I don't mind another couple of days. Let's, <laughs> let's not push it, David, no, no, especially no. in it's, this. I'm looking for years. Are you? I'm not letting you go home. Help! <laughs> Let me out! <laughs> I want to get out! I've had enough! <laughs> Calm down. Get some shut-eye, eh? It's the day of reckoning, when our experts will come to judgment. The appointed place is the lovely Devon town of Tavistock, and our experts are going to watch their auction at the Guildhall. 
This former police station and courthouse was built in 1848 to deal with rising crime occasioned by the 19th century mining boom. Are you going to get out? Yes, 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 I am. Right. Have you been on safari? You're impatient, aren't you? I forgot how impatient you were. <laughs> Have I been on safari? You're such a cheeky <laughs> minx, aren't you? Well, you look fabulous anyway. Thank you. <laughs> the eyes of the law are on you. Silence in court. I'm liking this. <laughs> Oh, my lordy. <laughs> I sentence you, David Harper, to crimes against trousers. Rightly so, Your Honour. Two years in the dock. Off you go. <laughs> you're loving this, aren't you? While you're down there, try and make a bit of profit as well. <laughs> While Judge Dolly Parton and David bring themselves to order, their items have been sent to Beedale, where they're going under the hammer at M.W. Darwin and Sons Auctioneers. They'll be bidding online, by phone and in the room, and presiding today is auctioneer Michael Darwin. You all done at 80. David parted with £235 on five lots. Thoughts on those, Michael? The lead garden scene, I think it's been in a box for a lot of years. It's in good condition, but I think it might struggle because it's just so fragile. Catherine's five lots cost her the sum of £228, Michael. The iron and wood clothes rail is a good quality item, but I'm struggling to find who's going to be wanting to buy such a thing. Uh, but we'll see. Indeed we will. Back at Tapperstock, the courtroom has been brought to order and proceedings are getting underway. And first in the dock today is David's pottery cat. We know the great British public adore cats, cats. and dogs. And a £30 bid oh. to anyone. No. At 32. Come on. 35 now. 38. 40, sir. 42. 45. Jordan at 42. Cat mad people. Well, I think I was quite lucky there to get out of that. Do you know, I have to agree. Uh, I thought I'd probably pay too much, but there you go. It's a tiny profit on paper. Talking of paper, it's Catherine's Japan letter rack next. It's got a look and I think it should be OK. Well, at £18, it's no money. £10 bid, 12 anywhere. At £10 only bid, 12, 15, 18, 20, 2, 25, 28, 30, 2. <gasps> 32 now. Oh, I love it. Oh, a £30 bid here, ladies bid at 30, 2 anywhere. At 30, she's back, 32. 35, are you sure? At 32 pounds, I'm selling it at 32. It's always worth going the extra one. Well done. Well done. Well done. I'm pleased. Oh, so you should be. Well spotted, you. Thank you. Seriously. And can David's lovely Delft vase aspire to a similar profit margin? It's up now. A bit of Delft, you can't beat a bit of Delft. A proper piece of antique Delft. 30 pounds for it. 20 pounds bid. Two, 25, 28. 32. I'm out at 32. 35 anywhere. At 35. 38. 40. 2. 25. 48. 55. 60. At 55. Oh, oh, 60 anywhere. Come on. Come on. Nothing online. Hold on. The way it goes. He had high hopes for that too. <laughs> I'm trying to get over it. We're trying, aren't we? Yes. We're pretty trying. Hold up. Hold up. Pull yourselves together. It's time for Catherine's close on Ivar's. How much for it? £30 pounds for it. No, no. £20 bid, two anywhere. Two. 25, what do you pay again? £25 bid, eight anywhere. At tw 28, fresh bidder. 30, two, 32, 35, 38. At 35 pound downstairs, eight anywhere. I'm selling that at 35, you're all done at 35. I think it's just all right, isn't it? It's, okay. it's all right. At least it's only a small loss. I was a slightly disappointed with that because I actually thought that was better than that. David's got his eye on the main chance with his jardinier going under the hammer next. It's a big lump of bronze, big Japanese bronze monstrosity. I have several bids oh, on this. Come on. And I will start at £75, 80 anywhere. Oh, David. £75 come on. With me. Come on. At 80 now, at £80. Pounds. I'm selling at 80. You all done at 80. Get in there. Thirty pounds. Ha! Well worth the punt. You're happy with that? Very happy with good. that. That's good. Under the hammer next, it's an airing for Catherine's clothes rail. When you left the shop, did you hear champagne corks popping? No. No. Oh, I thought you might have done with the no. owner celebrating. 
Don't be rude. We've got bids on this and a £40 bid. Five now, 50. At £50 bid, five anywhere. At 55, 60 pounds. Well, there you go. Five downstairs, 70. I'm selling then at 70. All done at 70. Well done, you. Well done. Not so bad after all. I've been having nightmares about it. You know, that. honestly, if I'm going to be absolutely straight with you, I thought that would have made 20 quid. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's an oriental knocker. Why? It's a big brass door knocker. It's horrible. It's wonderful. £30 for a start me for it. No £30 bits. of a door knocker. £20. Ten up. £10 bid, 12 bid, 15, 18, 20, 2, 25. 25 at £22.25. 28, 30, 2, 35. Go! At £32 only bid. Five Come on. Anywhere. I'm selling then at 32. You're all done at 32. The world has gone bonkers. No, it just isn't interested in your old knocker. I don't know what, what to say about that one, You'd actually. <laughs> Moving on, then, it's Catherine's Scandinavian silver brooch. Everybody wants Norwegian. Do they? Or Danish. Right. Jewellery at the moment. OK. £40, £20 would start me. £20 bid, two anywhere. 25 28 30 32 35 38, 40, 42. At 40 pounds on the phone, 42 fresh bidder. 45, 48, 50, five. At 50 pound on the phone. 52, oh. 55, 58. Going then at 55, you're all done at 55. Well done oh. you, oh, thank and you. rightly so, rightly so. More than double. Excellent. No, that was really good, really good, and worth every penny. Oh, well, thanks, David. Yeah. Let's see if David's last lot, the lead miniature garden scene, has a good chance. How much of that one? I've got bids on here. Come on, come on. And I've £25 oh. pound bid, eight anywhere. At £25 pound <sighs> only bid. At £25 pound bid, eight now, 30. No. I'm selling that at 30, you all done at 30. You can almost hear the expert weeping, can't you? <laughs> you can see him weeping. <laughs> We feel your pain. And the little people were sweet. I really thought that was going to potentially fly. Yeah. I really did. But there you go. That's just the way it moves, isn't it? Well, time fairly moves too. And last up is Catherine's silver and enamel timepiece. I've got bids on this and a £40 bid. Go on, then. At 42, 45, 48, 50, 5, 50, 55, 48, 55. I'm out at 55. He's out. Anyway. At 60 fresh bidder. Five. 70, sir? Five. At 70 pound with you, sir. Five anywhere. No! At 70 pound, no! only bid the clock. At 70 pound, bid five is back again. At sure? At 75 pound, I'm selling it then at 75. All done. Oh. Oh, bless you. You don't mean that. I know I don't. I've been completely <laughs> insincere. I'm not. That's a shame. I don't know who's come out of this best, actually. Because. Or worse. Hey. Let me enlighten you. David made just a little more than he lost and ends up this time after auction costs with a new total of £346.40. However, Catherine made the most profit and is the winner this time with the princely sum after sale room fees of £280.96p. Well done, my lord. Come on, then. Ready again, next one. Another one bites the dust. Last chance. Next time, it's the last leg. Hello, Dolly. Oh, my goodness me! And, uh, hello, Dolly. It's a fetish doll. Bridges are crossed. It's remarkable. Scores are settled. Yeah! David! And the road trip steams on. Incredible!